time. Um, again, my name is Brian Chapman. I'm the owner of Willamette Weapon Lures. Please make sure you like and share this feed. For those of you that have jumped on my lives before, we spend time and we dive deep into talking about bass fishing, talking about crankbaits, lures, uh, fishing philosophies. We talk about all of it. It's a lot of fun. So make sure you like this. Make sure you follow um, and make sure that you share this live feed with all of your buddies because this is going to be good. Um, let's get started. <laughs> it's Wednesday. I told you guys I was going to start doing um, these live feeds on Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays. And the whole purpose is to give you guys great information and to be able to show off a few of my really um, a couple of my custom painted lures. Now, for those of you that know who I am and know have been following me for a little while, you know I love to throw crank baits and jerk baits and top water. Um, I I like I'm a power fisherman. I like fishing it, but I fish a lot of different ways, a lot of different for a lot of different fish as well, um, and so. You know, while a lot of the things I'll be talking about are topwaters and jerk baits and crank baits, there's a lot of other things too that I'm going to include. And you, this may not be your cup of tea as far as the type of lures, but the same philosophy can be transferred over into other um, lures. Whether you're throwing spinner baits or jigs or swim jigs, you name it. We're going to be talking about it all today. Um, let's say hi to uh, Flint. Thanks for joining, man. K uh, KJ. Thanks for joining. Uh, Tim, man, good to see you again. Felipe, hey, there you are, buddy. What's going on, man? All right. Okay, here we go. Okay, so listening to bass. This is so important. And the reason it's so important is it's the difference between going out and catching one fish and going out and catching 30. Or the difference from having a 20 fish day and having a 100 fish day. It's, it's, it's huge. And so as many of you know, a lot of you have a foundation and I, I'm for the, for the purpose of this seminar, we're going to call it a knowledge base. Okay. So you always start off when you go out fishing, you're going to go out and you're going to go out with a game plan based on seasonal movements, water clarity, available structure, and even sometimes even species of bass, um, large mouth tend to act a little bit different than say small mouth. And smallmouth act a little different than spotted bass. So depending on where you're at, you're going to have a different approach of how you do it. But here's the thing. Every single bass tells you a story. Okay? Every single, whether you catch them or not. When you go out on the water, most important thing, you need to be paying attention to details from the time you get to the launch ramp in the morning till the last cast of the day. It's so important. Things like wind or water temperature, wind, light penetration, current, they're all going to be factors to take into consideration as you approach your game plan. Okay, we're going to go through a couple of little scenarios um, today, but I'm, I'm talking more in general terms, right? I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to save the scenarios for, during, for the questions because that's what really brings it home is the personal experience. You know, I've been bass fishing since I was... 10 years old. So I'm 35 years bass fishing. I grew up around a lot of uh, fishermen that knew a lot and they learned it from, they didn't learn it from watching it on the internet. They actually got out, they experienced it and they taught me to do the same thing. So paying attention is really important. Now, in addition to the water temp, wind, um, light penetration, current, there's a couple other things that you need to be paying attention to when you're out on the water. Um, Okay, uh, Okay. so remember, save your questions to, to the end. Write them down. I promise I'll answer them. Just stick around. I'm, I'm going to get through this for the guys, that, all of you that need to leave. So the other thing that should be included in things you're paying attention to are things, that, um, things like bird activity. Very, very important bird activity. They'll show, they have a bird, they literally have a bird's eye view as they're looking down. They're looking at bait fish. They see what's going on. They have to survive too. So they're tell, showing, watching them, watching what they do. And I'm gonna have, I have some really great um, tip um, examples of about bird activity, but I'll, I'm going to get to that. So um, bird activity, presence of bait fish, ones you can see. 
So a lot of times you'll see shad flipping in the, you know, flipping on the surface. You'll see uh, bluegills swimming around the gra you know, around grass or, or just hovering underneath docks. Um, you're going to see other animals, even other animals tell you a story. Mice, raccoons, mink, beaver is a big one for a lot of us, especially if you fish rivers. There's beaver all throughout the United States and beavers tell you a lot about what's happening in an area. Okay. And we can, we're going to talk about that. Um, so pay attention. Every detail is going to help you catch more fish. Let's, let's, let's give a little, a little mini scenario. Um, you know, showing up in the morning, everyone says, oh man, these, these fish, you know, you're fishing a clear water impoundment. I grew up fishing clear water, so I'm comfortable fishing clear water. Everyone, oh, oh, ah, perfect, perfect, perfect. Yesterday at the U.S. Open on Lake Mojave, they went from the first day where you had some wind to yesterday, it was dead still. There was hardly any wind at all, and it made the fishing really tough for so many people. Guys had, the guys were on a certain pattern, and they were, and a lot of guys struggled yesterday because the water went completely slick. What that tells me, it tells me a couple things. One, it tells me there's a lot of guys fishing fairly shallow. When you have really clear water impoundments and slick, calm conditions, those fish get really wary. As soon as you show up to the ramp, that's something you should be paying attention to. It's a detail, right? Details are important when you're when you're trying to establish what are the fish telling me? How do how would I need to adapt so I can catch more fish? Um that that's a prime example. You know, it, it typically when you're when you've got stuff like that, you need to be finding deeper a little bit deeper cover, you need to be finding denser cover, something that so those fish feel secure, and you need to be able to pivot. That's the big thing. So um, we're going to, we're going to keep going and we're going to come back to a couple of these things. So every, every fish you catch or not catch is going to tell you a story. If you know what to listen for, um, you want to get better. If you want to get better at bass fishing, you have to think you can't just go out on the water and blind cast all day long. Everything matters. You know, sometimes it's a matter of, you know, if say the fish are shallow, which is my favorite way to catch them, right? But if you're fishing clear water and you and you and you're fishing shallow, if you want to make a, a you tend to want to have a really delicate presentation because if you throw a lure out there and it makes a big splash, you can spook the fish, right? If fish are really active, they're going to sit there and it doesn't matter how big of a splash you make, those fish are going to come up and eat it. But because bass are predatory creatures and they're wary of fishermen, you make a large splash chances are the fish is going to take off and you just spooked a chance. I learned this on one time we were out there. Uh, I, was fish I, I actually hired Bobby Barrick as a guide out on the California Delta one time. I just wanted to see a master at work. I mean, really, I, I, I enjoyed fishing. I really enjoyed learning, but I wanted to see a master at work. How did he approach things? What is he doing? And it was surprising how many of the areas that he fished that I've actually fished before. But the way he approached it was different. The way, you know, the lures he was throwing was different um, in some cases. And so it got me thinking about all these things that, you know, that he's paying attention to that I wasn't. Maybe I went out with something, well, I did this before and now it's, and I'm assuming it's going to work again. That's not always the case. Remember, make sure you guys are writing down your questions. Make sure you share this feed. You have friends that need to hear this. So. You got to think. And that's what Bobby taught me is, is you got to think when you're out on the water. He says, you know, when you're fishing an inside grass line, you got to remember it's a foot deep. Those fish can see everything. They can hear you. They can feel you. They know what's going on. They are the apex predator in the in the river. And he he would get he'd actually got a little irritated with me when I'd cast it and make a splash. He goes, no, don't do that. He says, take that crankbait pitch it up onto that rock and slip it into the water real quietly. And I'm like, but won't it crack the crankbait? He is not if you cast it carefully, fire it up there, let it sit real. I mean, this is where casting ability comes in. Now, this is for shallow water. It made such a difference when I would pitch that crankbait or spinnerbait or whatever it was right up on the rock, I'd slip into the water real quietly, or I'd make just an almost stealthy type presentation where it just barely made a ripple. I caught way more fish than when I would sit there and make it splash. Huge 
It was about paying attention to shallow fish and knowing what's going on. So many of us love to fish shallow. We like to fish shallow rock. We like to fish shallow wood, grass, everything. Presentation is important. Um, okay, so what I want you to do is when you're out on the water and you're making a cast, no matter whether it's with a crankbait, spinnerbait, plastic worm, jig, swim jig, you name it, swim bait, whatever, every cast is a question. If... Oh, okay. Every, sorry, I got my notes here. They're kind of jumbled. Um, yeah, think of every cast as a question you're asking. Keep asking the questions, okay? When you get bit, it's really important to pay attention to where you got bit, how you got bit, how deep was it? Um, you know, how did the fish hit it? Did it come from the side? You know, where was it going? You know, if so many times you sit there and you start fishing and you start thinking about you're, you're looking for your next cast and you're not paying attention to the one that you've got. I make the same mistake, believe me. But being able to at least have the presence of mind to, as you're f casting and as you're fishing, being able to, um, you know, I'm, let's let's stay with it. Let's stay. With, let's go with the spinnerbait scenario for a minute. I'm throwing a spinnerbait down a bank, okay, and all of a sudden I catch a fish. Immediately I need to go to how fast was I reeling it? How did that fish hit it? Was, did it come from behind a stump? Did it come from behind grass? Was I pulling it up? Was I dropping it down? How did I catch that fish? What made it strike? How big was the fish? You know, that tells a lot because bass of a certain size tend to school together. Um, this is based on experience. If you're catching pound and a halfers, you're probably gonna be spending all day catching pound and a halfers. It's not to say that there's not a bigger fish in the area. But those fish that you're targeting are smaller fish. So when you catch a nice one, a three or four pounder, it's like, you know, instead of just going, yeah, I got it. And you're hooping and hollering, which is fun to do. Pay attention to where you caught that bigger fish. What was it feeding on? Was it, you know, did you catch it on a spinnerbait? Did you catch it on a, on a crankbait? Were you fe reeling it fast? Were you reeling it slow? Did you drop it and let it, you know, let it free fall while, you know, while you're fishing? All these things are important. Um, think of, you know, the other thing I want you to think of is, and this is something that we've talked about in some of my lives before, you know, bass need three things to live in an area, right? How many of you can mention the three things that I talked about last week? One of the things is they need to have access to deep water. They don't necessarily have to be in the deep water, but they need to have access to it. It's security. It's that's all it is. It's security. If the water, to, if the water level starts dropping, the fish can pull out. If the uh, water temperature starts to cool suddenly, you know, like overnight, for instance, um, they have a, they have a place to go that's safe, right? Um, they the second thing they need to have they need to have a food source there. If you don't have a food source, there is no fish that are going to be in that area. That's right, Flint. They got to have food. So the first thing is they got to have access to deep water. Deep water can be a relative term. On a, you know, on, in, in my neck of the woods, deep water is 50, 60 feet. In, um, you know, if you're fishing in the California Delta, 20 feet is deep water. Um, if you're out there in uh, Missouri, 80 feet probably de is deep water for you. So it's all important things to think about. Um, so they need the, the access to deep water. They got to have a food source. And thirdly, they have to have something to sit next to. That includes the bait fish, okay? So let's let's take a scenario. You pull up on a long, you know, this is, here's why points work so well. You, typically, points on a, on a main lake start off really shallow, at the, you know, right on the shore, and as they lead out into the body of water, they usually lead out into a creek channel where it drops off. Points are perfect because you can have, you have, um, you have shallow water, you have access to deep water. As long as there's food, they have something to sit next to. They have an edge. Even if there's no rocks or wood or trees on that point, more often than not, there's at least an edge, a shade line, something they can sit next to. Now you have throw a ball of shad on top of that point. You've got the prime ingredients for an excellent spot to have bass in. Now you got all, you got all three of those ingredients, right? You go through it with a topwater and you don't get bit. 
it's more off, more like more than likely you're asking the wrong question. It's a, it's the presentation. Those fish aren't interested. Maybe they're not that active. Maybe they're sitting in ten feet of water and they're not wanting to come to the surface to chase that top water presentation. No matter how perfect it is, ask a different question. Pick up a crankbait. Pick up a square a, a, a crankbait or a spinner bait or a jig and ask a different question and see what those fish want. What if you when you ask enough questions you're going to get the answer that you want to hear. Then you can start di really dialing it in. Again, thank you for joining me. Make sure you guys are like uh that you guys are liking this post or this live. Please share it with your friends. They do need to hear this information. Okay, so if you get out there and you're throwing that top water, you're asking the question, right? You're asking the question of the bass. What are you telling me? If they're not biting, they're not telling you anything, you got to ask a different question. And the way you ask a different question is you give them a different presentation. I tend to like to go, because I, I really like to power fish, I will tend to go from the most active lures, that would be topwater, crankbait, spinnerbait, um, swimbait, to slower and slower presentations until I get the answer that I'm looking for. But I don't, I'm not, I don't want to waste my time, right? I want to make sure that I've done my homework. I know that my area has access to deep water. I know that there's a food source. I can see a food source there. I can see shad. I can see bluegills. I can see, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's, maybe you have uh, blueback herrings, in your body of water, right? And they're out over open water on a you know on a on a deep point. Well, bass can also relate to the bait fish themselves. You you already know if you're over 50 feet of water and you've got fish busting on the top, those fish are there. They have access to deep water to be safe. They have a food source because they're eating blueback herring, right? And they can actually relate to the bait fish themselves. It's something to sit next to. You, I've, I've seen so many videos and a lot of people just kind of pass them over. But one of the ones that I really like to watch are, um, I'm trying to remember the name of it. It's like Inside Look or something like that. They go up on the Great Lakes and they show these beautiful underwater uh, videos and photos of both bass and crawdads and bluegills, um, perch, muskie, you name it. I love watching stuff like that. But I've experienced where I'll be sitting out like where I was at Lake Mead one time and it was there for like 10 days. We were sitting over like 50 feet of water and this ball of bait was sitting in 20 feet during the middle of the day. They were sitting right in that thermocline layer, right? Well, we drop out, drop down a spoon. You're over 50 feet, but you're catching them out of 20 feet. What are those bass relating to? You're, you know, 200 yards from the shore. There's nothing down there except depth. Those fish, I call them pelagic bass, where they relate to the bait fish themselves. They All three things match. They have something to sit next to, right? The birds are more likely to attack that ball of bait than they are that bass, right? But you have the, the bass can relate to the ball of bait. They have access to deep water, and there's a ball of food there waiting for them. I hope this and throwing a lip list like this. Maybe you need to ask yourself, what are they feeding on down there? Now, from all of our experience, we know that if you get down there and you're looking at a big cloud of bait fish down there, it's and you're in the south, it's probably going to be threadfin shad, right? Unless you live on Hartwell or something like that and you've got those blueback herrings. Up here in the Pacific Northwest or in all of our northern states, we don't have those. But we do have other schools of bait fish, and if you just have to know – kind of what they look like when they're on the bottom of the screen. I know that in a lot, a lot of the bodies of water that I fish with, we have a lot of yellow perch. And in our bodies of water, yellow perch look like little balloons sticking off the bottom where you've got, it almost looks like a string off the bottom. And then you've got a ball of bait sitting right there off the bottom. And it almost looks like it's attached to the bottom. It's really neat. Um, but you can see what yellow perch look like on a depth finder. I'm sure that across the country, you have your own bait fish that you've seen, that you know what they are. You, you'll catch a bass and the bass comes up and spits it up. When you catch a bass, pay attention. It's really important. 
Are, are they spitting up bait fish? What kind of bait fish are they? You know, one of the things that I really like to do is when I catch a bass, no matter what technique I use, is I will take pick up that bass and I'll see, that's me holding that bass right there, for instance. Okay, that particular bass had super sharp teeth. It told me that it was feeding on bait fish. Now, I didn't know what kind of bait fish it was until, uh, because ev everyone kept telling me, oh, they're eating, they're eating crappie. They're eating crappie. And I'm like, what? that doesn't make sense. There's no crappie that shallow right now. During the late summer, those crappie are, tend to be fairly deep, right? Well, we get over to camp and these bass started busting on these bait fish and one flew out of the water. Me being paying attention and listening to the bass, I run over there and I catch one of those bait fish in my hand and it happened to be a yellow perch that looked just like this, okay? We went from not having a really great day to, you know, we went, we went in, tried to get out of the heat for a little bit. There happened to be a tournament that day and so we we're kind of watching the people fishing and it was, we were having kind of one of those days, it was like, eh, it was okay. The bass weren't really telling us much, but that little bait fish threw it, you know, threw that, pushed that bait fish right up on, or that bass pushed the bait fish right up onto the shoreline. And the, uh, I picked it up and I went, that's not a crappie, but it could be mistaken for a crappie by someone that didn't know what they were looking at, right? All they see is silver flashes in the water. So, what do I do? I go over to my tackle box. I pick up my box of lures that, that of my perch colored lures because I know that in that lake, yellow perch is the dominant forage species of bass. That's off of my from my knowledge bank, right? But I didn't know how big they were or what they look like. Now I do. This happens to be my irresistible perch. But I, now I know how big they are, and now it, now I can start narrowing it down. So I reach in my box. I pull out all the stuff, and I go, okay. I'm gonna, t I'm gonna throw on a square bill because it's the same size. In fact, let me show you that, that little perch so you can see it. Um, you'll see what I'm talking about. All right, where'd it go? I've got it right here. Uh, perch, 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 perch. There it is, right there. Okay, that's my hand right there, okay? So, this is my, this is my perch, this is my hand. This is the perch pattern. Look how big that bait that bait is. Okay, I'm listening to the bass. I'm listening to what they're telling me. I saw them chase one out of the water, so I know that they're keyed in on that size bait fish. So I threw on this Mako square bill on one rod. Then I threw on this little wasp because it's again same size. Oops, same size as that little bait fish. We let we left camp, went out started looking for cues about what was going on. We went out and we started looking and we started looking, okay, where, where would these bass be? We saw birds diving. We pull up into this one, this one arm of the lake and we went, okay, we see birds chew, bite, you know, chew, diving down on these bait fish. They're all, birds are all over the place. Some of them were resting, some of them were waiting. We pull up and like second cast, boom, I get one on a square bill and I went, oh, we're, let's go. So we start working our way back into this area and we start catching one here, one there, way more than what we caught earlier in the day. All of a sudden, now things are starting to click together, right? Because I paid attention. I paid attention to what the bass were telling me that they wanted to feed on. They were telling me, put away your crawdads, put away everything else and throw something that's super lifelike and the same size of what I'm feeding on. Well, we get back to, into this cut and my buddy catches one on a jig. And so we stop, we put the talons down and we're sitting there start casting. I went 18 fish for 18 casts. Boom, boom. That was the difference between having a mediocre day and having a phenomenal day just because I was paying attention to what was happening. If I would have just been sitting there at camp, just chilling and joking around and not really paying attention to what was going on around me, I would never have noticed that little bait fish flip on the walk, you know, flip up onto the bank. And I probably wouldn't have had it as good a day. Okay. Um, so next thing, um, if like I said, you're not getting the answer you want, ask a different question by asking, by what I mean by asking a different question, 
Try a different presentation. It could be the same thing with the, with the lure. Maybe like if you're if you decided to try say a jerk bait like this, this is my little wasp. If you you know you could try just casting it out and reeling it back. Those fish that I was seeing, that's not what they were wanting. They were sitting right there in the current with their nose into the current, and they wanted to keep that lure in the strike zone as much as possible. I caught a few fish on this. I caught a lot on this by keeping it in the strike zone. So um, I asked the different questions. I got the answer I was looking for, and we went with it. Okay. Now, one thing I remember from when I was from when I was young. I used to read all the Bassmaster magazines. There was a ba magazine called Bassin. Um, there, there was a couple of there's Bass Bassmaster Bass Times. There was a couple other magazines. This is before uh, internet was really popular. But I remember reading this quote from Al Linder, and he said, "Not all bass are doing the same thing at, on the same day in a lake." It was, it was something to that effect. But it stuck with me, and so I pull. You know, when, when you're when you pull up in an area and you've got those three things that you need to have to be successful where you're fishing, um, you know, those fish, you know, here's an example. I was out, I was out, I was watching somebody during a tournament. I actually was a spectator, but I was, I was actually on the boat and you're not allowed to say anything and you're not allowed to offer advice, but I was able to talk to him afterwards about it. And we were going, we were fishing on the river and he found he got he got on a pattern like it was like clockwork. If you had X and Y and Z, whew, those fish were stacked in there. But what was weird was you'd sit there and he had like a milk run of about ten spots, and about six of them they were they were all identical because he goes I've I've had this pattern before, and you know I'm sitting there thinking about it and I'm like we pull up and he he was throwing a white spinner bait and refused to deviate from that white spinner bait. And it did well for him. I mean, he caught fish. All he caught fish whenever he'd get to those areas. But there was four areas that were like, "Man, this is prime. It looks alive. I see. It look. I mean, it. There's birds around. There's water movement. It looks like fish should be there." Well, what what dawned on me was maybe he wasn't asking the right question in those particular spots. The other spots he had asked the right question. Those fish were feet keyed in on eating bait fish. They were eating a white spinnerbait. What if he would have thrown a red spinnerbait or a brown spinnerbait or thrown a jig in those areas or thrown a crawdad uh, crankbait um, you know, through there? Maybe those fish were really keyed in on crayfish rather than bait fish. You know, again, it's a question that you need to ask. You know, if you find yourself in an area where it's like, man, there should be fish here, try a different presentation. Maybe, you know, maybe it's a difference of changing uh, from a bait fish to a crawdad. Maybe it's a difference of changing from a topwater to a crankbait or a jig. You know, one classic example, we were fishing in this area up on the Columbia River up near Boardman, and there was a lot of grass in the water. Well, these fish were, the water was June clear. I mean, you could see down 10, 15, 20 feet in some spots. And these fish were really hesitant to come out of that grass to eat. You know, you, you could pull a crankbait through there and you got a little one here, one little one here, one little one there. But, and I went, okay, well, I was having a lot of fish follow it, but they wouldn't like commit to it. They didn't want to eat it. So what we would do is we'd say, okay, throw that crank, you know, throw the crankbait up. I catch one little one here. I'm like, no, nah, I know that there's some better fish here. Well, I picked up a jerk bait, fired up that jerk bait. Don't, don't, don't. Boom, I got a bigger one. But, what was happening was in that particular area, there was a lot of loose grass that was floating down through that area. And it was really frustrating because every other cast, I'd get fouled up with grass on my jerkbait. And it dawned on me, wait, 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 I have another presentation that can pull through this area really well. Let's see if that works. So I tied on a fluke, on a zoom fluke. Sure enough, boom, boom, boom. We started getting more fish and bigger fish because I was able to throw that fluke, let it sink down a little bit, let it twitch bait, twitch into that grass and let it fall into that grass. And because uh, fluke is a weedless presentation, boom, super, I mean, we, it was, that was the right question to ask given those circumstances. I hope everybody's with me. 
Um, AJ, welcome. Brody, welcome. Make sure you guys are sharing this live feed. We're talking about listening to bass today. Um, and I kind of went through some of the stuff that you want to uh, pay attention to as far as starting off with a game plan and then paying attention to what's going on around you. You know, one of the things that, and I'm, this is where, remember I said I was going to be going back a little bit. One of the things that I wanted to talk about was um, uh, make sure, sorry guys, make sure you guys ask your questions at the end. I promise to answer them all. I will, t I have plenty of time today, but I want to make sure and get through the presentation for you guys. Um, in fact, you know what? I'm going to go through the rest of the presentation and then I'm going to come back and I'll start giving some answers along to kind of go along with your questions. Okay. So we're listening to Bass. So when you're out there and you catch a fish, first thing I want you to think of, I want you to stop and think. Think about how did that fish bite? Did it come up from the top? Did it come from the side? Did it come from weeds? Did it come out of rock? Where were you fishing? You need to start thinking, where was it positioned? You know, one of the things that I try to talk about a lot when I'm on, when I'm teaching fit people how to fish, whether I'm at a club, you know, a club meeting or I'm doing a live like this, is I talk about target spots primary and secondary target spots just you know so when you're when you hook a fish you know let, let me explain what a target spot is a target spot would be it'd be like you going down the bank trying to call your shot right it, the, there should be a fish right there on that stump there should be a fish right there on that lay down there should be a fish right there on that point those would be tar primary target spots that you like i expect to catch a fish off of those but sometimes what we don't pay attention to are those secondary target spots, the ones you maybe can't necessarily see. So a secondary target spot would be uh, like a, a point off of a point. So maybe you've got a long tapering point out on this lake, right? And so you got this long tapering point and there's got a little point that sticks off into one other creek channel where you've got maybe two creek channels to come together and you've got a long point and another secondary point. Well, that secondary point could hold fish. The primary would be the main point, right? But the secondary one might be that little offshoot off of that point. There, it's important to pay attention to. Where did that fish come from? I got a great, great anecdote about this one. I was showing a really good buddy of mine who worked for Pen Reels, right? I was out on the California Delta and I was explaining this exact scenario. You know, here are the primary target spots. What you can't see is on a minus tide, there was, there's this one bank where there's, it was just beautiful. It had a mix of tulies and grass, big rocks where current would flow around them, had really deep water out in the middle of the channels, like 20 feet. But what, what the secondary target spots, and you had to know um, wh kind of where it was, but the secondary target spot was there was a concrete block from when they were built the levee there was a concrete block that was on the ground underneath at the very bottom of this bank, but you wouldn't have known it was there unless it was a minus tide. A few, a few hundred yards down, there was a couple of logs that were down deep that you would never know were there unless you'd been there at a different time of the tide. The primary target spots were the ones that you could see. There were little pockets in the grass. There was tulies. There was, you know, little rock um, eddies, all sorts of stuff as you go down and you could catch one here, one there. Well, I pitched into this one pocket that I knew that there was a, a, a block. I mean, it was a big, huge cement block. And I'll tell you something, I got myself one that was almost 10 pounds and I just about shit myself. Cause I was like, yeah, it was exactly what I've been talking about. You know, f doing fishing, you know, fishing the t primary stuff caught me a few, but those secondaries, because I pay attention to stuff like that, produced something bigger. And then I was able to go down and work my way down and f really concentrate on those secondary points. And I caught bigger fish on each one of those points. They were all three pounds or better. Nothing quite close to that 10, but I had a lot of three and four and five pound fish by not focusing up shallow. I let him hit all the primary stuff and I hit the secondary stuff. But I, and I was able to point it out. And while it was funny, it was just, it was one of those things that was ironic because I was actually explaining what it was and I was able to actually show him. And he just sat there and went, no freaking way. That's the kind of stuff you need to be paying attention to. So 
How did the fish bite? You know, one of the things that I noticed, and I remember reading it a long time ago. I don't remember where I read it, but I experienced, I've experienced it many times where you throw up, say, say you throw up a, a plastic grub. I like throwing like five inch grubs, right? Yamamoto grubs, one of my favorites. I'll throw up a grub and you'll throw it up and that fish will literally make your line jump 10 feet. Okay. I know many of you, a lot of you can understand what I'm talking about. When you throw that line up and all of a sudden it goes boom and moves. A lot of times you won't even feel it. You'll just see it move 10 feet. That says, I'll, it speaks volumes. I set the hook. I reel them up. Now, I know that that fish jumped 10 feet, right? Or and well, Chances are it swam further than that, right? But I've got the fish in my mouth, in my hand, and I go, okay, first things first, what is it feeding on? I stick my thumb in his mouth, and I go, okay, it's got sharp teeth on the top. Chances are it's eating bait fish. What was I throwing to catch that bait fish? It's probably a green pumpkin tube or a green pumpkin five-inch grub. So that tells me a couple things. One, it's eating a bait fish. Now, what kind of bait fish was it that was on that bait, that looked like green pumpkin? Okay, I don't know yet, but I, it start you know pieces of the puzzle, right? This is what we're talking about. Hunter, yes, I promised. <laughs> I promised to answer questions. Um, make sure you write them down because I'll, I'll get to all of them. Now, because of the fact that that fish jumped and made that made that line move. That tells me something else. That tells me there are more fish in that area because a fish that doesn't have to worry about anything will just inhale it and crush it and eat it right there. If it's got to compete with other bass, whether there's one or 10 or 20, that fish is going to grab it and run so that it can eat it, right? Chances are it's still sticking out of the fish's mouth. You need, you know, but that that's something that when you see him jump like that, it says there's multiple fish in the area. Go back, fish that area more thoroughly. Try a couple, ask them, ask some more questions. You know, is that the only fish there? Throw, throw that lure back in there. You get it. Chances are you're going to get another one. If you, and you stop getting bites, don't necessarily leave yet. Maybe it wants a different presentation. Maybe it wants a jig down on the bottom. Maybe you need to try a, a, a plastic worm drag through there and see if you can get some other fish to go. When you have fish that react like that, it means that there's more fish in the area. Pay attention to it. If you're just out there goofing off and you're not really paying attention and that's your goal, have fun, enjoy. But a lot of us want to be better. We want to catch more fish. That's that's me. I'm a fish whore. I want to catch them all, okay? Or at least on our boat, I want to be just catching tons, right? I don't get a chance to fish as much as some other people. And so when I go out, I really want to catch. So I'm paying attention. If I catch a fish and it's and it just sits there, it goes thunk, and it just stays. Chances are that fish is a solitary fish, or there's a, maybe a few other fish in the area. And I won't. I may throw a couple more times around that tree or around that stump, but I'm not going to spend time on that stump. Whereas if I that fish grabs it and runs right away, guess what? I'm going right back on it. Um, oh, Chris, thank you so much for the order. I will get your order packed up. It will go out tomorrow morning. It's not going to go out today because I'm already 40 minutes into this and I know there's a lot of questions. I know you guys are sitting on the pins and needles going, come on. So let's keep going. Um, the website link is WillamettWeaponLures.com and you can go to, so you can go to WillamettWeaponLures.com, use that code TikTok at checkout and you can get a discount off your first order. Uh, bu -bu -bu, here you go. This is the website. You can go ahead and screenshot at any time. Here's your discount code, TikTok. Um, so let's talk about, so we talked about the fish running. It's fish are competitive, right? They're aggressive. They grab a hold of that thing, run. That tells me there's more fish. Now, I more often than not see this on in a little bit deeper water. Maybe I'm fishing on a point, right? And there's multiple, a school of fish on this point. And a lot of times you'll be sitting there reeling up that fish and that you'll see other fish trying to take it out of his mouth. That's why sometimes we catch two at a time. It's so exciting when it happens. Um, but take a look at it. So, and we talked, let's see, we talked about, oh, let's, on, like on this, on this particular one right here that I caught. Notice where I caught that fish. I caught it right on the front hook. That says a lot. That says that that fish is feeding. It was committed to eating that bait. Bass on for bait fish, 
will very rarely hit something tail down. They usually will hit it head down, especially with like bluegills and fish that have spikes on their um, on their backs. They want to hit that thing head first, and they want to be able to swallow it head first. So that that's why you, you normally only see tails sticking out of their throats. There's a reason for it. When a fish is feeding, it's gonna eat it just like this. It'll I'll usually hit it on the front hook. What happens if the fish hits it on the back hook? Now. Excuse me. A couple things can happen if a fish, if you catch a fish on just the back hook. One, I'm I'm reeling the bait too fast. Now, some people say you can never reel the bait fast enough. I disagree. It depends on the conditions that you're faced with. If you've got super hot fish that are actively feeding and they're just crushing anything that moves, then absolutely, you could crank that thing as fast as you want to go. This particular, you know, in, in this particular scenario, those fish wanted a, 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 a different cadence than what my partner was using. He, because he didn't get anything on a jerk bait like this, but I was. But what I was doing is I was giving it two short little jerks and then giving it a big pop. And what that did is it was go boom, boom, and then dart, and then stop, and it would stop. And I go dun dun, where it would walk side to side and kind of fold over, and then a big jerk where it would move out. And more often than not, what was happening was as soon as I, I would try to, I would give it a dunt, dunt. So that fish knew it was there. I give it that long pull and I would, I'd try to time it so that the jerk bait was sitting right at that first drop off where I was noticing the fish were eating, but they wanted it to stay in that strike zone for a long time. So you get their attention, boom, boom, jerk in front of their face and leave it there and twitch it and bam, that's when they would hit it. It's all about paying attention. Um, you know, the back hook could mean that the fish kind of looked at it and you gave it just the right action at the last minute and it just reached out and, you know, and just kind of swiped at it. When I'm catching them on the back hook, it could be that. It could be that maybe, I'm, you know, I'm not using exactly the right color. Maybe it needs to be, here's an example. We were out there fishing and, um, you know, I started off throwing this bluegill pattern because this is my favorite. This is one of my favorite bluegill patterns, but I was catching a lot of fish right here on the back hook. I switched to this pattern because I had dove in the water and I actually saw these, this color bluegill in the lake. And I went, I better, you know, maybe I better try something that looks exactly like what they're eating. And almost every single one, the entire crankbait was in their mouth, not just that back hook. So in that case, it was color, not necessarily the movement of the bait. Um, that jerk bait, if you're catching them on that back hook, then I would try a couple different things. Maybe first thing, try a different cadence because you caught a fish on it. So you obviously have something that's similar to what they're actually feeding on. But I'll try, so I'll try a different cadence. Maybe I'll let it sit there longer. I've, I've experienced where if you throw it out and you give it jerk, 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 and you just sit there and wait. And you go hum da dum da dum, jerk bam, and they hit it that fast. They hit it because it that long pause. I mean, thirty seconds, a minute even. I had one time I was out with my dad out on this lake in California, and we we're fishing this stump flat. Right, all these fish were sitting right out on the off the edge of the stump flat, and I you could go through it once and catch the active fish with the spinner bait. You could turn right around and start going back through it with a jerk bait. But what you would do is you throw it out and you give it a jerk. And if you let it sit there for a minute, all of a sudden you see the line start swimming off. That fish wanted it sitting in that strike zone, just not even moving. And I, I was throwing a Lucky Craft baby bass pattern. And I go, Doom, and I start, I start eating my sandwich. And my dad goes, what are you doing? I said, watch. And all of a sudden you see the line start taking out. I go, dad, look, I got a fish. He goes, no way. That's how fit long those fish wanted it. That's what they were telling me was they wanted it sitting there in a long, uh, they wanted it sitting there for a long time. Now, that's not always the case, but for those fish, that's what they were telling me. And I figured it out by accident because that's exactly what I was doing. I was, I, I threw that jerk bait out and I would give it a, hum, hum, and I would take a bite of my sandwich or I'd grab a handful of seeds and all of a sudden I got bit and I went, oh, pay attention. I got bit because it had stopped. And those fish, that's how they wanted it. 
So I started doing that on purpose and I caught a lot more fish and I didn't have a problem going behind people. These, I had guys going down, throwing spinner baits, dragging jigs, doing all that stuff, and they were catching nothing. But because I figured out what those fish wanted, I listened to them, I caught a lot of fish out there. Um, okay, so uh, we talked about front hook, back hook, you know, whether to hook deep or near the lip. Um, you know, a lot of times you can t see the fish's mood based on what color lure they hit. You know, I, yeah, in fact, Monday somebody asked me, do you ever throw bubble gum? Well, normally no. When I go to when I go to a lake, I'm usually looking for feet actively feeding fish. But if I'm finding that fish aren't actively feeding, but I can, but they're kind of in a, an aggressive mood, maybe they're um, hitting, they're just kind of slapping at my lures. I'll try a hot pink, or I'll throw a bubble gum, or I'll throw a bright chartreuse, something that just, uh, and they they want to hit it. They glorious for this. Boom, boom, boom. You're throwing that spook out there. It's walking, you're walking the dog. And all of a sudden, boom, you see the spook fly three feet up in the air. And boom, it goes right back on the surface again. That tells me so much. In the moment, I'm excited because I'm like, oh, I just got a strike. It tells me a lot. That tells me so much information. First, it tells me, it, I, I have to ask. Remember, I'm at, I got to ask questions. I got to keep asking questions. When that fish hits it, what's going on with it? What do I got to do that's different? Maybe I need to change my cadence to it. Maybe I'm using the right color, but I need to slow it down. You know, one of the things, one of the neat little tricks that I've done that is when I have fish that are smacking at a bait, but they refuse to eat it, throw on a, a feathered treble hook on the back of a spook and watch every single one of them choke it down. Because what happens is it, they'll be sitting there going, doom, 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 and you'll stop it. And all of a sudden you see that, that uh, tail's flare and boom, they come up and they don't even hesitate to eat that thing. Normally I'll run a spook without a feathered treble. But if I get fish that are like striped bass, for instance, or I'm getting small mouth, they're just kind of smacking at it and you're going, oh, I've, that's the fourth bite I've gotten. I haven't caught fish. Stop and think, ask a new question. Are, maybe I need to change up the color. Maybe I need to change up the presentation. The presentation could be the cadence that I'm walking the dog with. It could be just adding that feathered treble hook. I fished a tournament up on up at on the Columbia River one year, and the first day these fish were hot. They were active. They were moving. The second day, you'd see them roll on it, but they wouldn't they wouldn't take it because you know you, with the top water when that fish rolls, you don't automatically set the hook. You wait to see your line moving. You wait to see something else happening. So that thing's moving. That fish rolls. You wait to see if that lure pops back up to the surface. Well, I got like nine strikes. Hello, McFly, wake up. I said, watch this. I caught him on this color yesterday. I put on a feathered treble. I didn't miss a single fish the rest of the day. Those fish were to on top all day. I caught them on top water. That's all I threw all day was top water. And, but they wanted that feathered treble. Otherwise they just kind of roll on it. And I was able to test it. I have, you know, painting my own lures, I'm able to have multiple of the same one. So I had one rigged up with a feathered treble and one without, and I cast that one, it fish would roll on it. I go back with that feather, they never hesitate. They'd swallow that thing every time. Listen to the fish, listen to what they're telling you. Try to think about what is it about that that made that fish bite. Instead of getting frustrated and getting upset, they're trying to tell you something. You gotta listen. Um, you know, I've experienced time out on the water when it did, you know, the, the lure of the, it, the fish were so heavily pressured that a red crankbait or a, let's, let's do a, a, a shad pattern. A Tennessee shad pattern wouldn't cut it. You had to be exact with exactly what those fish wanted. Those fish want perch. You give them something that looks super realistic on perch. Okay. And I've noticed that uh, and I've even noticed that sometimes they're so pressured. It's the difference between having a bait that rattles and one that doesn't. There's a lot of baits, you know. That's I think that's why so many guys like throwing balsa baits out there in the Midwest because most of the balsa baits don't have a rattle in them. They're completely silent except for the sound of the hooks coming through the water. It's something different. It's something that's not quite so. I can hear you coming. Uh, yeah, I've seen you before. It's something different. You combine, if I, here, let me show you one of my, there you go. 
you combine that coat, that super lifelike pattern on a silent bait in really he he heavily pressured waters, you are going to catch more fish because those fish are going to not, first off, they're not going to hear it coming. They're going to feel it coming, right? It's something different. Most, no two balsa crankbaits work the same. When I fight, when I'm fishing really heavily pressured waters, a lot of times I will switch it up to a bait that's quiet. That includes jerk baits, top waters, you name it. They'll do it. That's not always the case, but it's when the fish are telling me that they're being skittish or they just kind of, sometimes you'll see them, you, it's so frustrating. I'll be throwing a spinner bait sometimes and you'll see them swipe at it and flash. Well, why didn't that fish grab a hold of it? You know, is it, I mean, in those cases, when those fish are just swiping at it, a simple trick is to just add a trailer hook to it, right? But a better trick is to figure out, okay, what do I got to do to get that fish to completely inhale it? Am I, is it too gaudy? Is it too, um, is, is it one of the things that I see a lot of, especially this time of the year, I tend to downsize my, uh, let's go with spinner baits, right? My really good friend, uh, friend Flint Pierce was on here a little bit earlier. He owns battle bait spinner baits or battle baits, battle baits. If you wanted some great match the hatch, spinner baits, jigs, top water, go to battlebaits.com. But I buy it, so I get all my stuff from him. But what I do is I will actually take and downsize that back blade in the fall. Because think about it. You have all those adult shad and adult bait or adult bait fish that spawned in the spring, and you have all those little juveniles in the fall. As that water temperature starts to cool, those fish, those all those little bait fish start getting into smaller, you know, big schools of bait, right? But they're still itty beady. I'm a match the hatch guy. I'll match the size of the bait fish. Now, if I'm finding that the bait fish are big, I'll stick to a bigger size blade. But it's little things like that put extra fish in the boat for me. And it fills me full of confidence when I'm out there as well. Um, let's talk about um, smell. You know, so many, I know I, I'm a huge fan of using scent on my plastics. Couple reasons. One, um, the actual taste of plastic or the actual um, thing of you know, the actual texture of plastic is caustic actually i mean you you want the fish to eat it because you want to catch a fish but given just sterile environment they want to have something that actually tastes good um and so smell can have a big difference on it sometimes it doesn't matter the, the little things like the smell of my hands say, say i eat a um i ran into this one time you know i had a buddy that brought pepperoni pizza onto the boat and his hands were all oily from the pepperoni pizza he never caught a fish the rest of the day after he ate that pizza and i told him dude go wash your hands he went washed his hands came back started catching fish again it was something little like that but it's it's he wasn't asking the questions um let's talk about vibration and wobble you know one of my favorite crankbaits and i'm going to show you two different ones here Both of these crankbaits are similar in size, but they have different actions to them. Okay, this is a square bill. This is my Mako square bill. And this one right here is my uh, depth charge. Okay, this depth charge has a much wider wobble. It has a different vibration sound than this one is. This one, you, you, it's gonna fish a little bit faster. This one's a little bit slower. Maybe the answer, especially in cold water conditions, is using something that doesn't quite have so much of a thump, you know, and especially in really cold water. I mean, think about this. You know, one of the one of my favorite baits in the wintertime is a shad wrap. I like throwing SR7s, I like throwing SR9s in the wintertime. Why? I'll tell you why. Because bait fish don't hardly move. I mean, they're if, if they're just as cold as the bass are. So they're not gonna be sitting there super active, darting around, jumping around. If I'm gonna present something naturally to a fish, I'm gonna throw a shad wrap that I custom paint, you know, in, in a pattern like this, for instance, in the winter time, this would be a really good one, but because it has a real subtle action to it. When you're moving that thing through the water, it's just barely wobbling like this, and you can stop it and pause it, and it'll sit there and just stop, 
and maybe float, start floating up a little bit and then it starts working again and you can fish them really, really slow. You, I will even wait, you know, if, depending on what the bass are telling me, I will even weight them down a little bit. I'll stick and put a, put suspend dots underneath them so that I can adjust how fast those things rise up. You can even make ones perfectly suspend by adding little suspend dots on them and it just leaving it in that location. Okay. I hope that makes sense. Um, so be, you know, having different, um, actions to the bait, knowing when to throw what kind of things, a lot of that you're going to get from experience, but the fish are going to tell you what they want. If you go in and this is your number one crankbait and you're not getting bit, you got, you're going to have to look at doing something else. You're going to have to try something different. You're going to have to try, maybe they're not eating bait fish. Maybe they are. Maybe you need to go to a little SR5 uh, shad wrap and because that looks more like the bait fish or it's more like the active or the action of the bait that is that those fish are feeding on all these things when you're asking when you're asking the right questions you will get answers to all these things um okay so um i'm almost at my hour up and i hope you guys are getting a lot out of this please make sure you like and share this thing i'm going to keep going because i'm almost done and then i will answer all of your questions one at a time and I'm actually going to grab a pen and I'm going to write down some of these questions so I don't miss them. So um, here's another one. Fall rate or speed of retrieve. I kind of put both of these in the same category. But um, so, for instance, I had a buddy that um, one of my really good friends, he's still a really good friend of mine to this day. He taught me so much about bass fishing. Okay. He told me this one place that, you know, this one uh, spring, it was, water was still really cold. And he said he was throwing a five, eight, a five, eight ounce jig. He was flipping a five, eight ounce jig in shallow trees. If you threw a quarter ounce, you'd never get bit, but you threw a five, eight ounce bit by a uh, jig and bam, you'd get slammed. I mean, it was a difference between having 20 pounds and having five. That was the, there was that big of a difference, and what it was, and the way, way the way he was ex understanding it was, these fish were cr they were crunching on crawdads. These crawdads were just starting to come out of their hibernation or their their, their little they didn't want to move right. You know they um, they kind of went catatonic during the cold water. But as that water starts to warm up, they would poof mud out of their holes, and that's what those bass were looking for. They were waiting for bat crawdads to push the mud out of the holes, and then they sit there and wait for the crawdads to come out and they'd eat it. Well, that five eighths ounce jig on that particular bank, he'd flip it in there, it would fall, and it looked just like that poof of a crawdad coming out of the hole, and those bass chowed down on it. I remembered that, and it's, now I've been able to actually apply that knowledge when I'm out fishing. I'm adding it to my, um, oh, what, what, what did I call that? My knowledge, my knowledge bank. That's what I called it. It was my knowledge bank. Um, it's it's important to have a knowledge bank, but it's also important to add to it. Um, you know, sometimes those fish want it falling slower. So you may have the right color jig. You know, I've had buddies that say, man, tie on a black and blue jig with a, a June bug brush hog trailer and you'll rock the snot out of them. Well, notice they kept the weight out of that. Well, I've experienced where you know, ha being able to slow it down, you know, so putting a quarter ounce jig and putting on a June bug trailer didn't necessarily quite do it. But if I put on a, a big brush hog trailer, I could slow that bait down really slow and those fish could eat it. Or if I wasn't getting bit, I could put a smaller brush hog trailer and it would fall a little bit faster. It's those type of little things that will help you catch a few extra fish. Um, speed of retrieve. You know, especially it's super, super important right now because of how fast all of the reels have become. So many of them are, I mean, a slow reel right now that you can buy on the market is six, three to one gear ratio. If you're throwing a crankbait, guess what? Six, three to one is still really fast. I personally like throwing five to one most of the time. For big deep diving crankbaits, I like a three, eight to one. How are you going to throw a deep diving crankbait on a seven to one or eight to one gear ratio reel? It, you're going to wear your arm out. It, that's why a lot of these lures are going away because everyone's speeding up the process. That's not always the best thing to have. 
So being able to slow down, you know, I've had days when those fish, when you throw that lure out, you a couple turns of the crank gets it down to the bottom and you literally just use the rod tip to move the crankbait along the bottom. That's how slow they want it sometimes. And if you're not doing that, you're not getting bit. Whereas I could be sitting there having a great day, you know, getting a, you know, getting that 15 or 17 pound bag and my buddy, not so much. Vice versa has happened to me too, where he's doing something different, say with a swim bait, where he throws that swim bait out and the how fast he's reeling it makes a difference. I've, I have fished with this one guy. He, the guy's an awesome fisherman, right? But he throws that swim bait up, lets it sink to the bottom, and all he does is pick the rod tip up and then use and then let the current carry it down. And then all he does is reel up the slack. He picks it up, let the current carry it down, and reel up the slack. Well, I'm sitting there trying to reel it real slow, thinking, yeah, I got this. I know better. Boom, he's getting four pounders. I'm getting twos. That's the difference. Those fish, when when they're when he's just lifting it up and letting the current carry it down, it's a very natural presentation for those fish. And meanwhile, I'm trying to, you know, do something, you know, trying to outsmart them. And he already knows what those fish want based on his 60 years of bass fishing experience compared to my 30. Make sense? It's all important stuff. He has a knowledge bank about what to do under different circumstances. And the more stuff that you do, the more questions you ask, the more stuff you're, the more stuff you're going to have in your knowledge bank. You know, um, let's talk about, so we talked about that, talked about color, um, you know, the more stuff that you can add into your knowledge, you know, so when you get done off the, off the water, remember, we're paying attention from the time we get to the launch ramp until the very last cast at the end of the day before we head back to the ramp, right? Pay attention. When you're on your way home, instead of just sitting there zoning out, think about what happened during the day. What could I have done better? You know, it's kind of like armchair quarterbacking, right? It's like, yeah, if I just would have done this, if I just would have done that. Well, by doing that, and going, here's what I saw, here's what I experienced, here's the fish that I caught or didn't catch, here's what I can do for tomorrow, or here's what I can do for next weekend when I come out. And you're able to log that, what not to do or what to do, depending on your success. But it's all about listening for bass. So, uh, oh, I found that quote. So um, from Al 